Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged. Good morning. How is everyone today? Fantastic. I love how when I ask a question like that, everyone's like, ah, do we all say it at the same time? It is wonderful to have you. Welcome to LPC. We're excited because we get to gather together to gather to worship God, to experience his word, to celebrate together, and to also learn a little bit of what we look like with whipped cream on our face. So I know a few of you are probably here for that, and uh, for all of you, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would love to be able to read our call to worship this morning. And we're going to be looking at 1 John 2, 7 to 12. And John is writing to a letter to his churches to inspire them. And he says these words, Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment is to love one another. It's the same message you've heard before, yet it is also new because Jesus lived this truth and this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in the darkness. Anyone who loves one another, another brother and sister, is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother and sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. I am writing to you who are God's children, because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. So live like him. Best thing to celebrate. We have the greatest thing to be honored. God loves us, and he's given that love freely for us. And now he calls us to love others in return. And that's how we can be a light in a world of darkness and need. So let's take an opportunity to celebrate together, to express our love to God, and to show some love to one another today. Let me just take an opportunity to pray, and then I'll hand it over to our worship team. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for these opportunities that we have to connect with you, to experience you, to realize that you're alive, you are well, and you are here with us, you're present. May we be able to experience you in a life-changing way. Continue to fill our hearts and our our whole life with your love so that we can be a light to a world in darkness. We can share your gospel with other people in need and we can be able to make an impact for good and change other people through your love and your grace. We ask and we pray for this morning, for all the different elements we have in place, may it go according to you and your will. We pray for all of this now in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. 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 Thank you so much for praying with me. If you would do me the favor now of standing on your feet, we will worship worship God together.
Father, that you would be our firm foundation in everything that we are facing in life, every struggle, every difficulty, everything that we are feeling like is beyond our abilities and is impossible for us, may we be anchored and grounded in you. And may you be the one who brings our provision and what we need for all of these situations and circumstances, God. Because with you, it's your love that fills and sustains us. It's your love that saved us. And it's your love that can give us a message of hope to the world and a reason for living and a mission that is greater than us. May we be grounded in that love, Father. And we pray, God, for all the people we know that are needing your love today for the people who are not here, for the people who are not connected to you, who don't know you, God, may you encounter them in a real way. May you change their life. May you bring them back to you. For the people who are going through sickness and challenges, God, bring your healing and your love and strength to them right now. For the people that need direction and a greater understanding and wisdom, God, may you show up and provide for them. Because, God, you are the only one who is a source of hope and answers, and you're the only one who is actually faithful and unfailing. So we put our trust in you. We believe in you, God, because it's only through you that our lives can be whole and worthy and full, God. We ask and we pray for these things and for you to continue to fill us up, God, because we can't have enough of you. We always need more and more of you. We pray for this now in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen, amen. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, this morning I thought that we would kind of just, uh, for the students it'll feel like a repeat, but for everybody else I wanted to have an opportunity to kind of just highlight some of the stuff that I took away from Overflow. Is that okay? So we went to Overflow, and the theme for Overflow was First Light. It, it comes from, in First John chapter 2, verses, really the focus verse is verse 8, but it says this, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new commandment, rather an old one that you have had from the very beginning. To love one another is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this. He lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light. The first light is already shining. Can we pray? God, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would have your way, that you would speak mightily this morning, that the voice of God would be felt and heard throughout this room. Jesus, we've come to honor you and glorify you. And so, God, we pray that you would uh, move in our hearts and in our lives this morning, Jesus. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you so much for your love that was poured out and shed for us. We pray it in your name. Come on, and everybody said, amen. amen. So how many people would agree with me if I would say to you that in light, darkness no longer exists? When you, when you go to bed at night, how many people love to sleep in total darkness? Yeah, I would say I do. Uh, I didn't used to. Until, like, until I got married, I slept with the TV on, full volume, so that I felt like I wasn't alone. Um, but Laura loves to sleep in utter darkness. Well, really just loves to sleep, but mostly in utter darkness. Uh, I'll, I'll figure that one out later. But it's true. It's true. If you go into a room and you turn all the lights off and you close all the curtains and all you see is darkness, the minute that you even open, a, the minute that you turn your phone on, the minute that you turn the light on, the minute that you open a curtain, darkness doesn't exist anymore. And so we wrestled with this and we were challenged with this all weekend long. All weekend long we were challenged with this, that no matter how dark it is, the second that there's a glimpse of light, the darkness has to go away. And so the students have heard this already, but for everybody else in the room, I want to challenge you this morning to say that it's time that we need to get back on track to chasing the light instead of the darkness that we face in our life. You see, because when Jesus comes, when Jesus came and he poured out his heart and he would go and he would die for us on that cross, 
He died showing his love. He died showing that he could conquer darkness for once and for all. And the truth of the matter is this, is that Jesus' light is often revealed through his love. So you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering where you're at or what's going on in your life. You feel like you're facing darkness. You feel like you're facing loneliness. You feel like you're facing maybe anxieties or depressions or the circumstances going on in your life. Can I encourage you this morning that if you feel like there's darkness, chase Jesus. Chase his love. Because his love conquers all darkness. And we know that, and you've probably heard it preached 500 times, but at some point it has to become real. At some point it has to become real in our hearts and in our spirits that we would actually believe that we serve a God who's bigger than everything that we face. That we serve a God. And so Overflow was this opportunity where students were invited the first session, the second session, the third session, to come to this place where they would say, I just need Jesus. And to be honest, church, I probably rewrote this sermon three times because I was just convicted and wondering what God wanted to actually do, what he actually wanted to say. And, you know, it's, it's cool because there's such, a, there's such an energy in the room this morning because all the kids are fired up to throw pies at us. Uh, and it's true, and it's so exciting, and we're looking forward to being able to do that for them. But the reality is this, is that I think it's time as a church, I think it's time as a, as a church, and not just, not LPC, but as a church, the whole, the entire body of Jesus Christ, that this may for the first time become real to you again. That the first time that this may become real to us, that we have to understand that God never intended or planned or wanted us to live in darkness. And so he came and he sent his son Jesus who died on the cross, who rose again in the ultimate display of love. You know, when Jesus rose from the cross, he went to hell and he took the, great, he took the keys of death back. He took the keys of death back. He conquered darkness for you and I. And I just wanted to encourage you this morning to have an opportunity to say to the rest of the church, the students have heard it, the students have heard it, they've seen it, and they've responded. But to everybody else, it's time that we believe that God is who he said he is. It's time that we believe that the powers that God carries with him, the powers to conquer the grave, to, the powers to conquer our darkness, the powers to conquer the depth, the things that we don't let anybody else know, the things that we've never revealed to anybody else. I'm here today to tell you that Jesus wants to conquer those things. He wants to conquer those things. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. And so I, I heard... I heard months before Overflow that they were talking about bringing this guy from Ghana who lives in Calgary, who's got a youth program of like 300 kids to Overflow. And I've heard of his name, and his name is Jeremiah Nigor. Uh, and Jeremiah came and he brought this. He brought this new perspective uh, to a message that I've preached hundreds of times to a message that I've heard hundreds of times and it's this. So in John chapter 5 we find this moment where um, Jesus is returning to Jerusalem. He's returning to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem and he's heading for uh, this, this place or this pool called Bethesda, right? Which means house of mercy in Greek. So Jesus is heading for Bethesda and he gets to Bethesda, and there's thousands of people who are sick, who are crippled, who have, uh, you know, for, to put it in modern day, sick, who have uh, mental health problems and mental health issues. And this is what happens in this encounter in Bethesda. And man, when I heard Jeremiah preach, I was like, I have to be friends with him. I have to know him. Because he just communicated, and all of the students in the room would agree, that he just communicated so eloquently the love 
and the reality of Jesus in this story. And so let's read it together. John 5, starting at verse 1. It says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. And inside the city, near the sheep's gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind people, lame people, and paralyzed people lay on the porches. And one of the men, one of the men who was lying there had been sick for 38 years. That's important. When Jesus saw him and he knew that he'd been ill for a long time, he asked the man, Jesus asked him, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? And he says, I can't, sir. The sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool. You see, we'll stop here for a second. The pool of Bethesda was this place where people came to get healed, where people came to have reconciliation with their sickness and the things that they were dealing with. But the thing about the pool of Bethesda is that it only, they believed for whatever reason that it would only come when the waters would stir. When the things would start to go around them, when the water would start to bubble, they believed that was the moment they had to get in the pool. They had to get in the pool because they, if they could be one of the few who would get in the pool when the water stirred, they would be saved. Someone else always, the paralyzed man says, someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told the man, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and he began walking. So here's the question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? From whatever it is, and it's such a broad topic and a broad question. But the truth is, is that I believe that Jesus, just like he did last night, I believe, and this is where I started to rewrite. This is where I started to rewrite because God woke me up at 3.30 this morning. I was here at 8 o'clock and Jason Stein's like, what are you doing here? Like, I got to rewrite. And so I'm rewriting well, everything that's going on and everything that I feel like God's saying to me. And I'm hearing what he's saying and he's saying this. Church, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? The thing about this is that Jesus is really is uh, maybe one of the most broad questions that I think he asks. Because it covers such a vast variety of things. It covers such a vast, uh, a vast orientation, if you will, of different things that people could say, yeah, I want to get well for. And I want to kind of just for a minute encourage you as we break down what's going on here. As we break down... What's going on here? The paralyzed man who's laying on a mat, sitting by the pool, waiting basically for someone to be nice enough to kick him into the water when it bubbles, to kick him into the water while it bubbles, or while the water stir. He's laying on this mat, and he's been laying there for almost four decades. And I don't know what you, I don't know what you walked in here with this morning. I don't know what you're wrestling with, but can I just tell you that it's God's timeline and not ours? His healing, he waited almost four decades for someone to kick him into the water. And I just want to encourage you that if you've been waiting and praying into whatever it is that you're going through this morning, if he can wait four decades, we can wait one more day. If he can wait four decades, you can wait one more day. But the thing about this is, is that he asks the man, Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? And I think that that's a, that's a faith-shaking question for some of us. It's a question that challenges our faith. Because we sit here and we go, yeah, Jesus, I want to get well. Ooh, but you want me to deal with that? Maybe not. You know, and I, I ask myself this question. You know, a lot of uh, the students all know this, and a lot of other people in this room will know this, but for me, like, I have struggled with uh, anxiety and depression and suicide and all that kind of stuff most of my life. And I was sitting there last night, sitting in overflow, having this, like, wrenching pull in my chest 
that's like, do you actually want to get well? Because you say you do. And I think this is the reality for some of us in this room. You say you do, but you don't want to put in the work. Or you say you do, but you're scared of the commitment. Or you say you want to follow me, but you don't actually want to follow me to uncomfortability. Or you say you want to pour out everything for me, but you don't actually want to do it. So church, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? You know, and we were sitting in the room last night at Overflow, and I'm kind of processing through it. And, you know, we'll break it down a little bit. So do you want to get well is the first question. Most of us would say, yes, we do. The second question then is, do you want to experience freedom? from the things that have been holding you bondage, from the things that have been keeping you captive, from the things that you've been struggling with, do you want to experience freedom? And a lot of us would say, yes, we do. Do you want to get healed? Ooh. I think everybody in this room who's going through sickness or who has gone through sickness or who knows someone who's gone through sickness, the prayer is always, yes, we do want to get healed. And so we sit in this place where Jesus asked this paralyzed man, and he replies to him in verse 7. The paralyzed man says, I can't be healed. And I've said this too so many times. I can't be healed. I can't do it on my own. I can't get into the waters. I can't whatever it is. And can I just tell you this morning that Jesus doesn't care about your pool. He just cares about your commitment. You don't have to run to those you don't have to, we don't have to run to anything fancy. We don't have to go anywhere special. We don't have to do anything different. There's no water. There's no body of water that's going to heal us. When we go into the baptism tank and come back out, do we often come back out feeling like we've been redeemed, feeling like we've been whatever? The reality is this, is that Jesus, more than the pool, he just wants your commitment. He just wants your commitment. Your commitment to embark on the journey with him, to embark on this uh, adventure with him that would say, yes, Jesus, I want it. And so then Jesus says to him, he says, more than you need to get in the water, I'm going to heal you anyway. In verse 8. I'm going to heal you anyway. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And I think this morning that maybe God is calling some of us to pick up our mats and walk. To pick up our mats and walk. It's a very simple thing to do. It's a very easy step to take. It's a very common thing to do. And the thing is, is that this man who laid on this mat for 38 years, I love this. You have to think of all of the stuff that probably would have happened on that mat. You know, and I think the mat, and Jeremiah said this last night so well, I think the mat represents our life. You know, the mat is where, the mat is where we lay. The mat is the thing that we're entangled to. The mat is the thing that we hold on to. The mat is the thing that we won't let go of, and we won't let go of it because we feel like we need it. We feel like we need it. Our dirty, gross, as Jeremiah said, we're not quite sure what that smell is. Probably... Uh, a lot of different things built up together. And I just want to tell you that it, I think it's interesting that Jesus says to the man, take your garbage with you. Get up, take it with you. Take your mat with you. You know, the mat, I think, represents our life. And so we find ourselves in this final question this morning. I want to ask, Friends, are we willing, are we willing to follow Jesus, to believe in him for all of our healing, to understand that his love is the firm foundation that leads to everything else that we need in life. We're here tonight, we're here this morning, sorry, and maybe some of us are looking for that love. Maybe some of us in this room this morning don't, haven't made that decision, haven't made that commitment, haven't made that moment or taken that time to say, yeah, Jesus, I'm willing. 
Maybe some of us need to do it again. Maybe some of us need to say, God, I've lived a lot of my life thinking that I was willing, but I'm not. Jeremiah said last night, and I think all the pastors in the room kind of gasped a little bit when he said it. You know, but he said last night, he said, I would challenge you to get to the point where you can say, I'm willing to give everything. Jeremiah was telling the story about how he was in Rome and he was sitting in Italy in this spot where Paul wrote quite a few of his letters towards the end. And he's saying, and he was sitting in this room and he's sitting in this prison cell. He's sitting in this prison cell and he felt like God said to him, Jeremiah, are you ready? Are you willing? And then they left that place and they went to the Colosseum and God began reminding him of all of the people who would have been in the Roman Colosseum, the thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians who probably would have been executed there, who would have been killed there, Romans who would have gathered to watch and cheer as Christians were ripped apart from lions and ripped apart from other animals. Are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing to follow Jesus? And it's in those moments, I think, where when, if, we can get together to say, yeah, to hell or high water, Amen. for the good or the bad, regardless of what you have for me, I'm willing to follow Jesus. It's in those moments where we can say, yeah, I'm willing. That man was willing, the paralyzed man was willing to believe in Jesus enough that he was going to heal him that day. He was going to heal him that day. And the cool thing about this is, like, this is really all that we know about this man. We don't really know if he's a believer, if he's an active follower of Christ, if, he's, uh, if he would call himself a Christian when they have this meeting or this encounter, right? And so we look at it and we kind of are surprised a little bit, amazed a little bit, that God chooses or that Jesus chose the paralyzed man of all the thousands of people who would have been there waiting to get in the pool. He chose the paralyzed man to heal that day. Because the paralyzed man had faith that the love of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, and the truth of Jesus that all of us in this room, or most of us in this room, have come to know and accept could heal us, redeem us, or set us free from whatever it is that we're holding on to. And can I tell you that over the 36 hours, the ridiculously crazy and insane 36 hours that overflow was, can I tell you that we saw thousands of students physically respond to Jesus? Come on. And, and we can be honest, church, that's what it's about, right? It's not really about us movement. We can be honest. It wasn't really about us getting to go and bake in the sun all Saturday afternoon and feel like we all needed fresh showers and there was nowhere to go. It's not really about that. It's not really about the fellowship. It's not really about the times or moments that we could get together and just hang out and chat and connect. No, it was about those divine moments. It was about those moments. That's why they do what they do. That's why they do overflow how they do overflow. It's to see Jesus transformationally move in the lives of our students. But don't miss it. He wants to transformationally move in the lives of you today. And we believe it to be true. If God can move in our students, he can move in our adults. If God can move in our youngest student, who I think is 11 years old, who went to overflow, he can move in our oldest adult. Come on, that's the God that we believe in this morning. So at this time, I'd love to ask Esther just to come up and play. Um, surprise me. It's not going to matter. I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, God woke me up. This morning, God woke me up to say this. And I want to reiterate it. I already said it, but I want to reiterate it. God doesn't need a pool of Bethesda. 
He doesn't need a special move of water. He doesn't need a special body of water. He just needs you to say, I'm willing. And the truth is, is I don't know what's going on in most of your lives. I don't know what darkness you're fighting. But I just came to encourage somebody this morning. I just came to encourage somebody this morning. That whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you face, whatever it is you're challenged with. I just want to encourage you that the darkness has no place to stand in the light of Jesus Christ. And I think this morning, before we have some fun, that God wants to do something. He wants to move. And so I'm just going to let him. I'm not going to do anything formal or anything special. I think that God's just going to convict and call those who need to raise a hand or stand up or come to the front or whatever it is. He's just going to do it. And so we're just going to sing. I'll invite you to sing. I'll invite you to reflect. And if that's you and you want to take that step today to say, God, I'm willing through hell or high water, through the good and the bad, the positive and the negative, I need your light to shine through my darkness. If that's you, just come. You can come or you can stand or you can lift a hand wherever you are. We'll just take this minute to reflect here a little bit. Worthy of every song we could ever see. Show sure. 
Come on, church. I'd love to pray if somebody wants to, if they're not already up, go get the kids. Um, But I'd love to pray. Can I just invite you, if you're not, so that we can pray, let's just stand if you're willing and able. We're just gonna pray. Jesus, we seal in your name. In your name, we seal everything that you're doing, the ministry that's happening, the lives that are being transformed and changed the darkness that is disappearing, the light that is shining, the true light, the first light that is Jesus. God, we honor you and we glorify you this morning. We give thanks for everything that you're doing, everything that you'll continue to do. We pray it in your name. Come on, church, and everybody said, Amen. amen.